Hi, this is Jeffrey Towson from Peking University. I'm here with Jonathan Wetzel, who is a senior partner at McKinsey and Company and also a frequent co-author, co-professor, also professor of Peking University. And today we're talking about urbanization and over the course of this video, we're going to talk about sort of five uh, sections and five topics within urbanization. And, and the first of these five is the idea of how is urbanization in the past uh, different from what's happening now and what is coming? Urbanization is kind of this thing that starts, it's almost like flipping a switch. Uh, people, for whatever reason, wake up in the morning and say they want to change their life. And typically young people. I mean, most people who move from, from a country to city are somewhere between the ages of 15 and 25. Uh, and they're following their friend or their cousin or somebody from the village um, who said, look, I've got an opportunity over here and I don't want to marry the person that my dad told me I have to marry and I want to go to school or, you know, I want to have a diff I don't want to be a farmer. Uh, and so they get out and literally hitchhike their way. Now, at the beginning of this, back in the uh, 80s, you weren't hitchhiking because there wasn't a road. <laughs> Literally, so you were walking. And so actually old urbanization was about somebody walking, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 kilometers down the road um, to find, uh, find a, like a county town that you could work in a marketplace or you could build a building or something, just get hired in, no skills, nothing. Uh, and that was kind of where China started. And then it really also, I mean, it started with, uh, you know, along the coasts because the coasts were closer to the markets, and particularly in South China. So you had a lot more, so uh, faster urbanization in places like Guangdong, which is right next, to, right next to Hong Kong, basically. So it was natural that you could, more of these migration changes would, would happen there than, say, somewhere in the middle of inner China, where if you're in the middle of Sichuan, not much is changing in Sichuan. <laughs> there isn't a lot of uh, new marketplaces. There isn't a lot of new consumption. It's just... Uh, uh, what's going on on the farm is exciting, but nothing much in the city. Uh, so that, you know, is kind of where China was and what urbanization looked like. And it was a very, uh, this a granular kind of town by town kind of thing. Now let's roll forward, you know, 20 years or 30 years. And now we're, instead of being a 30% urbanized country, which is kind of where China was, it's now like a 45 or 50% urbanized country. And that 20% makes all the difference. Because now in China, 20% of 1.3 billion people, uh, that's 260 million people, 300 million people have moved into the city now. And so now these are literally new cities. And as a result, everything is much easier in the sense you can change your life faster. And so instead of walking 10 kilometers, now you get on the train and in three hours you've moved 100 years of economic history. <laughs> So that's the big difference, is that almost like it's an accelerating train of urbanization. And so the cities get bigger, the changes get bigger, the people, it's no longer just the 15 to 25 year olds, it's everybody from age zero to age 100. And so the cities become more diverse and they're more, it's more complicated as well to manage. Uh, and we're basically moving away from the era where it was like, amazing, this is happening. And so like, you know, wow, urbanization, it's happening to, okay, yeah, yeah, it's normal, but how good is it? <laughs> is it getting any better? So it's now quantity versus quality. And so what's the quality of urbanization? Rather than sort of like, it can happen, great, now we know that, in fact, it's, you can't stop it, but how do I make it better? And that's the question for urbanization going forward. So how do I make it better for everybody? How do I make the cities more livable? How do I make them uh, more clean? How do I help people, how do I make them more equal, more fair? Uh, so, you know, questions you wouldn't really ask uh, 20 years ago. It's like, hey, it happened, we're great. You know, it's gotta be better than the farm. Uh, and now we're not doing that. Now we're comparing city to city and saying, is this city better than that city? Is this city improving itself? And so people got more choice. Do any cities really jump out as this is what China is going to look like 10 to 15 years from now in terms of urbanization? You know, look at these cities. That's a good example of what we're probably going to see more of. Well, I usually say if you want to see the future, you go to the south, go to go to the Pearl River Delta, because it is the most urbanized part of China. And that means it's got, 
it's got the benefits in a sense like it's more productive and uh, it's more resilient, it changes faster. Uh, but it's also got the problems. It's got all the environmental problems. It's got the labor problems. And when you want to look for strikes and incidents of mass unrest, uh, you go to the south. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that when we look at which cities are doing well, we, should, we can say, you know, Zhuhai, Xiamen. Um, these cities have made a lot of progress fast because they didn't make progress for the first couple of years. And then they leapfrogged and they jumped. Uh, Zhuhai always seems to rate high on various metrics of livability. Well, why is Zhuhai always seem to make in that top tier? Well, I think, first of all, Zhu, uh, it, for, it's good location, location, location. <laughs> so, so be the right place. So Zhuhai is like in that golden triangle so, or quadrilateral. You know, you've got Hong Kong, you've got Shenzhen, you've got Guangzhou, and then you have Macau and Zhuhai. And for decades, not much happened in Macau and Zhuhai. I mean, everything else happened on the east side of the Po River Delta, and not much happened on the west side of the Po River Delta. Looking back, that was perhaps the best thing that could have happened, because instead of having the you know, radioactive wasteland that is Dongguan, you know, <laughs> sort of you know, multiple changes of business model, you had you know, nice, green, clean, I'm relatively educated, you know, population, and and therefore a lot of opportunity to kind of do better quickly, and so you could learn from the east and avoid that kind of intermediate industrial stage and leapfrog to what they want, which is a high-value service-led economy uh, with nice agriculture, nice nice nearby, nice environment nearby, good infrastructure. You know, it's sort of like uh, you know urbanization done right. <laughs> I mean, within that sort of location, location, location story, mm. what would you say the differences you know, that jump out between, say, Zhuhai and Dongguan, mm. which has had a really interesting kind of last 10 years? Yeah, well, again, Dongguan started off early as being just right on that road between Guangzhou and, and Hong Kong. And sort of like, so this was right, you know, like the Milky Way of Chinese urbanization, and they were kind of right in the middle of it. So everything that could be manufactured got manufactured. So you know, they started off as the mattress capital, uh, and then they became the TV capital, uh, and then they became the LED capital. And then, and then now we're going to the next wave, which is, looks like bio, biotech. And uh, so yeah, it's, it's just over and over this resilient reinvention of the economy. The, the folks who are running Dongguan, um, they're like land, they are landlords, they're the government. But they, they said, okay, if this concessionaire isn't working out, we're gonna change them. <laughs> It's fine. We don't have any, no romanticism about, you know, the LED factory of the past. You know, it's gone, done, let's figure out the next thing. Zhuhai, on the other hand, Zhuhai, again, didn't have that uh, sort of pace and then wasn't, wasn't like a market town from day one. Uh, it was a reasonable size, but very local uh, kind of economy. And so it proceeded slower, but then what happened is the central government and the Guangdong government say, hey, we've got this great piece of land. We've got this great you know, environment here. Um, it makes a, why don't we use it for something new? Why don't we use it to connect to the Hong Kong through the bridge and build the, build the highways up to Guangzhou and use all this great environment for what appears to be what people want now. They don't want the factory. They want the green. They want the beautiful service kind of environment. And they want the education. So this place is great for that. <laughs> What about other cities that sort of jump out as, you know, this is what we think more and more, okay, it's in the south, Zhuhai might be an example, Dongguan may be a different example. Where else in China would you look? You know, those cities got my attention because of what they're doing. We think we're going to see more of this. Well, I think elsewhere in China, there are a lot of great examples. I mean, obviously Beijing, I mean, <clears throat> and uh, Zhongguanzun, Haidianchu. I mean, it's Z Park. I mean, Z Park is its own city. And it's, it has a, if you add up all the revenue, Z Park, Zhongguansun Park, is bigger, it has a bigger GDP than I think half the countries on the planet. <laughs> Just this park. And so that shows you what you can do if you jam together educational, uh, manufacturing, fair bit of government, a whole lot of money, uh, you create global champions. And you know, that's, that's what you've got there. So that's, that's, that's great if you're like a mega city. You're going to think about how to stick these things together. Uh, if you're like a smaller city and you're looking to develop, well, actually, a lot of the towns outside of Shanghai, whether it's Quinshan or <clears throat> even further south, like Wenling, they benefit because they get specialized into an area or a product, whether it's a, a <clears throat> excuse me, a, a component 
uh, or a motorcycle part. And then because they connect very well and China did a good job of infrastructure, um, they can serve the big market but still have the low cost. Uh, and that sort of small town, big dream is the way the government puts it, is, uh, is where most people live. Most people don't live in the big cities. They live in these small to medium sized cities. And for them to keep living there, that town has to become specialized. It has to get more productive and it has to be connected. And so those are, those are the towns that actually can be like the future Portland or you know, the future you know, Seattle, sort of not the biggest town, but a really nice place and very productive in this thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if sort of urbanization going forward is a lot about these other sort of specialized smaller towns, maybe associated with the larger capital town, large cities, what does infrastructure look like 10 to 15 years from now as opposed to what we've seen thus far? Is yeah. it more of the same? Is it going to be different things? How, how would that sort of picture change? Well, I, I think the end of story is going to be like an all, all of the above. You know, it's not going to be like one thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll get the flying cars. Pretty sure. Uh, but we will also, and have, got the high-speed rail. Right. Uh, and a tremendous growth in air traffic. So I kind of think that you know, it's about integrating all of those things. And so the Hongqiao hub in, uh, in Shanghai is a, right here is a great example. It gets a million passengers per day through the Hongqiao hub, one, one with six zeros. And that is a combination of an airport, of a high-speed rail station, of a metro station, and, uh, and some light rail. So I mean, all of it. One terminal, two terminals next to each other, uh, and uh, walkable, and with, with great real estate around it, I should note. It's, uh, it's really the growth real estate of Shanghai. Uh, and that's the, the integration that makes it work. So people get more choice. So having all of these different types of infrastructure uh, is what matters. And you're going to need different types for different places. Some places are small. They can't support a metro. Uh, but on the other hand, China has, you know, I think 60 cities now building metros. It's the single largest explosion of metro building ever on the planet. And there'll be over 100 million people connected through those metros in those cities. You know, so that's, you know, metro is a big deal. But on the other hand, um, I like to think about infrastructure at a human scale. So what, you know, what do people actually use? And there, you know, the big story uh, is, is biking. <laughs> it's just you know, the, uh, the explosion of dockless, uh, dockless biking. So littering the sidewalks with millions of OFOs and Mobikes, I can, I can say that. <laughs> so. OK, so I mean, in terms of you know, urbanization going forward, um, what about these newer things that I think a lot of people didn't see coming? Nobody saw the bicycles coming. They just happened, and yeah. now they're normal. Yeah. But two years ago, everyone said, oh, we're not going to ride bikes again. Well, we're all riding bikes again. What other sort of new surprising things that are coming up as relate to urbanization? Uh, smart cities, bicycles, uh, links into agriculture outside of cities. I mean, what else is sort of bubbling up um, like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think that the tech enables so much new stuff, I mean, specifically the QR codes. So the sharing economy, uh, you know, we can share anything. You know, and people in China do. They, there are businesses that try to share sports equipment and, uh, and, yeah. and, and share laundry, actually. So, uh, so I, that leads me to the kind of circular economy, as I think there's a big emphasis now on sort of avoiding waste and sort of managing, particularly like in the food chain. Right. Uh, we know that you know, less than 30% of the stuff that gets grown in China uh, actually makes it to the table. Right. Uh, so you know, rethinking farming. So urban farming, it's coming. And uh, what, what would be urban farming? Um, tops of buildings, sides of buildings, uh, because it sort of it hits a bunch of a bunch of uh, benefits. It's food, but it's also energy. Uh, it's also uh, re it's a water. Uh, sides you know, of buildings? What, what uh, you hanging gardens off the sides of buildings. <laughs> it's uh, I, let's see how it works. But I think there's a lot of ex experimentation on things that we can do closer to the consumer. Uh, so the consumer gets more choice, it's fresher, uh, but it's also more effective and it's less wasteful. Uh, and the costs of waste are going to go up. So the, the, the putting fines on people for littering, uh, the, uh, you know, all, all of the, the problems that happen when you just dump stuff off the side of the train. Uh, so that there, the, the, this kind of uh, externality, as the economists would say, sort of the unplanned effects they're getting recognized, and now they're going to get planned. So that's what I—that's that's probably the biggest change in urbanization that I see going forward. Is sort of th saying, "Hey, let's not be you know random about this. Let's think about what do people 
what's going to affect people's lives and let's bring it closer to them so they have more control over it. Mm -hmm.